Thomas Moe is a retired Air Force Colonel and Vietnam veteran, served in the Navy Reserve and the Air Force Reserve. He flew 85, right, 85 combat missions in Vietnam until he was forced to eject over North Vietnam, where he spent more than five years as a prisoner of war until he was released during Operation Homecoming in 1973. He received his B.A. from Capital University and M.A. from the University of Notre Dame. Please go ahead, Colonel. Thank you, Chairman Lee and Senator Sessions and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify before this committee. I would like to express my concern regarding the nomination of Ms. Kagan to the Supreme Court for the following reasons. Some of them are referring back to some of the reasons my colleagues have mentioned as well. Chief among them is that she has demonstrated a strong bias against the military, particularly while dean of the Harvard Law School, largely over policies concerning the eligibility of homosexuals to serve in the military. As we've heard, in 1993, Congress passed and President Clinton signed Title 10 U.S.C. Section 654, among other things, the law provided that the administration could omit the requirement that persons joining the military make any reference to their sexual orientation, a policy that became known as don't ask, don't tell. In 1995, Ms. Kagan joined the Clinton administration as associate counsel, but I know of no stand that she took against don't ask, don't tell during her tenure with Mr. Clinton. But when she was appointed dean of the Harvard Law School in 2003, she began to loudly condemn the law and policy, calling it a profound wrong and a moral injustice of the first order disregarding the fact that the 1993 law was approved by strong bipartisan majorities in Congress. She also knowingly defied the particular law we've already heard about, the Solomon Amendment, which concerns military recruitment. As Dean, Ms. Kagan treated military recruiters as second-class citizens. She did not allow the military to recruit on an equal basis with other agencies and even called on her students to forcefully criticize military personnel. As we've heard on some occasions, she has expressed support for those in uniform, but such superficial gestures cannot mitigate her official actions. She apparently was encouraged by a ruling in 2004 by the Third Circuit Court of Appeals that the Solomon Amendment was likely unconstitutional, but this court had suspended its own ruling pending review by the U.S. Supreme Court. Nevertheless, in violation of the Solomon Amendment, Ms. Kagan continued to restrict military recruiters, recruiters at Harvard's law school. In 2005, she escalated from hostile words to legal activism, and she joined a friend of the court argument to the Supreme Court claiming that Harvard Law could bar military recruiters because it barred all recruiters who discriminated against homosexuals. But in 2006, this argument, along with the suspended Third Circuit Court ruling, was struck down by the Supreme Court unanimously. Even the most liberal-minded justices rejected Ms. Kagan's position. With a stinging rebuke, the court said that her theories were clearly not what Congress had in mind. She later acknowledged that her actions were not justified, but that said that she had acted anyway in the hope that the Department of Defense would not enforce the law. The issue here is bias, and Ms. Kagan's record reveals a persistent bias, at least regarding the military. As a citizen, I cannot support the appointment of justices who would pick and choose which law they wish to follow or violate a law in hopes that it would not be enforced. As a veteran, I'm even more troubled that an activist justice would not instead defer to the other branches of government, particularly the Congress, which the Supreme Court has itself recognized as more qualified to act on issues concerning the military. And what evidence is there that Ms. Kagan has shown an understanding of the Defense Department's position regarding homosexuals in the military? The 1993 law clearly states why homosexual activity in the military is harmful to its mission. While stressing that the military is a specialized society subject to special laws that would not apply to the citizenry at large. Those who don't understand the special nature of the military should not be handed authority to make important decisions that affect it. And I question whether Ms. Kagan has consistently applied her stated principles regarding discrimination against homosexuals. Her principles did not seem to come into play in 2007 when President Clinton, the sponsor of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, spoke at Harvard's commencement or, as we've already heard, when a member of the Saudi ruling family, a person in a position to influence the policy in Saudi Arabia which executes homosexuals, 
opened a school on campus and Ms. Kagan did not lift her voice against that. Lastly, I would think that a person so opposed to rules governing the military as Ms. Kagan would encourage rather than hinder uh, participation in the military by her graduates so that they might be part of the composition of the military's leadership and thus have the opportunity to influence military policy. It is unfortunate that Ms. Kagan has presumed herself the wisdom to demand the military to accept professed homosexuals. But in my view, she has neither the experience on which to base that wisdom nor the responsibility to deal with the consequences of her conviction. I thank you again, Chairman, for this opportunity.